Welcome back. Today we're looking at another topology inference tool. This one is called YARP and performs randomized high-speed active topology discovery. These slides are from a talk given by Robert Beverly, my colleague here at NPS, who is also the author of the YARP tool itself. So as background, the goal here is to infer the topology of the internet at scale. For quite some time, this question has been primarily answered by running Paris Traceroute, the tool discussed in our last talk. But to do this at internet scale, it has to be done by hundreds of machines worldwide working constantly to find an updated internet topology every few days. So the goal of this work is to accelerate that process and obtain topology snapshots more frequently and using less resources. Some of the reasons we care about the internet topology include research for those of us working on next generation protocols and architectures for the internet, as well as businesses such as CDNs that need to optimize their content delivery over the internet, folks managing networks, trying to understand traffic and internet paths or troubleshoot problems, as well as those making policy that affect internet governance. And last but not least, we have security impacts, including detecting things like routing hijacks that show up as changes in internet topology. DHS considers understanding the internet topology to be a critical capability for internet security. Some of the things that make this problem quite challenging is the vast scale of the internet as well as the fact that it is managed by thousands of different entities, most of whom consider their internet topology to be a competitive secret. Add to this the fact that it is constantly changing over time, and there is no designed-in instrumentation for revealing the topology of IP networks. The result is that today's internet topology remains poorly understood, no matter whether we're talking about interface or router-level topologies, or autonomous systems and organization-level topologies. As we mentioned, there is continuous topology measurement taking place using Paris Traceroute, and probably the best known of this is the CADA ARC platform, which has hundreds of nodes worldwide performing these traceroutes. The probing strategy there is to divide the IPv4 space into slash 24s, so blocks of 256 addresses, and divide those up across the 100 or so monitors worldwide and then pick one address in each of those slash 24s to probe, as well as probing the dot one address of each slash 24. Rotating through all the slash 24s and probing them is called a cycle. So the results of a cycle are traceroute probes to all routed slash 24s. The scamper tool mentioned here is the software that implements the Paris traceroute algorithm. So the result of this cycle is a snapshot, but that snapshot is spread over a day or two to traceroute to all the slash 24s. However, we know that the internet topology is changing constantly. There are thousands of updates every minute to the BGP topology of the internet. And so the resulting snapshot is conceptually smeared across many of these updates over the course of the day or so that it takes to collect it. So the question here is why can't we perform this much faster? Order of minutes instead of order of days. There's been prior work doing very fast scanning of IP addresses, which is different than topology. But what can we learn from that? So the question is, why is traceroute slow? And the answer is that one, it must maintain state. The more outstanding probes it has, the more state it would have to maintain. And importantly, it's sequential. So it probes a hop or a few hops and waits for those responses to come back before probing the next hops. So waiting on those round trip times for outstanding probes rapidly adds up to make performing traceroutes quite time consuming. If we do try to accelerate it, that means it's going to concentrate load along particular paths. A particular path that's being probed will see more and more of the TTLs expiring, and that has the potential to trigger ICMP rate limiting in routers or other IDS alarms. And as network researchers, we certainly want to be good internet citizens and not cause extra work for the folks running the internet. Or in the case of ICMP rate limiting, degrade our own results by getting fewer TTL expired messages than we should. So the implication of that is that the production systems have to go slowly. So how does the YARP tool address those constraints? YARP stands for yelling at random routers progressively and first came out a few years ago. The key here is that it randomly permutes the IP and TTL space, meaning instead of progressively probing increasing TTLs to one IP address, it sends a probe to one IP address at one TTL and a probe to a completely different IP address at another TTL. So in this way, it avoids concentrating load on particular paths by spreading the probes across all of the paths in the internet. Secondly, we mentioned that TTL requires state to remember what outstanding probes it needs to receive back. However, 
YARP encodes all the information it needs to into the probe packets themselves. So it doesn't have to remember the state in the program. It gets all the state back that it needs in the TTL expired messages. ICMP TTL expired messages quote the original packet. So some of the information that was sent out by YARP comes back to it in this quote in the ICMP error message. So these two features permit fast, large scale, active probing, even from a single vantage point. Here's an example of how it works. We have one prober and multiple targets. So a prober sends out a TTL2 message first. Remember, it's randomizing both the TTL numbers and the destinations. Then it happens to send TTL4 for the same destination, and then TTL4 for target two, and so on. And it keeps randomly sending these out, but because it's a permutation, it won't send out duplicates. So it will send out the complete set of TTL and destination pairs just in random order until it achieves the complete inferred map of the network. Putting the topology back together happens offline. So all the randomized results come back and then a separate process sorts them out and puts them together into traceroute style paths. So one challenge is creating this random probing order when you may have millions or billions of destinations multiplied by the TTL space. Then the second is mapping the responses back to the originating probe's destination TTL and origin time without maintaining state for each probe and knowing when to stop probing a path, as well as the typical load balancing issues that we discussed in the previous talk about Paris Traceroute. So the random ordering is taken care of using a block cipher. So as we said, the complete space is permuted. So the ordering is scrambled, but all of the TTLs for all of the destinations will be probed eventually. Then we have the issue of encoding the state. So this uses fields from the IP and transport layer header to encode various information about the probe, including the TTL being sent, the time at which it was sent, and of course, the target IP exists in the destination IP field. This uses the Paris methodology of keeping the flow related fields, the IP addresses and port numbers constant. This also encodes a checksum of the target IP in the source port, but because the target IP is not changing, the source port will not change either. This allows YARP to filter out erroneous packets that come back instead of recording bad data. Here's the message shown as the quote that's included in the ICMP error message that comes back, including the fields that encoded the information about the original probe sent. So without maintaining state, YARP still knows what the original TTL was, what the original target IP address was, what time it was sent, and has a checksum to verify that the packet didn't get changed along the way. Then we have the problem of knowing how to stop. Traditional traceroute, by going sequentially, can wait until it gets the ICMP port unreachable message that signals that it's reached the destination. However, since YARP is sending these things in random order, it doesn't really know when to stop. So instead we rely on statistics. We know that there's little discoverable topology past TTL32. So the first step is to limit TTLs to 32 or less. In fact, this is configurable within the ARP program, and we see that the majority of topology can be discovered with even fewer hops than 32. So the bound could be set lower than this. The ARP tool is publicly available, and the source is now open on GitHub for those who want to see how it works or contribute new features. As we said, the responses come back in random order and YARP just records them. And then we use a separate tool to reassemble them into trace routes. So after that reassembly, we have something that looks like a normal trace route output. These are stored in binary warts files, which are the same kind of files that the scamper tool uses, which has been the industry standard for topology inference data. YARP also introduces a couple of features to help optimize its performance and reduce any negative impacts on the network. One of these is to read in the BGP rib so that it only probes routed destinations. And the second is that it observes the local neighborhood. And so if it's repeatedly getting back the same routers over and over, it will stop reprobing the first few hops of the paths. Now for some results, or how fast can this go? So here are some of the constraints. Probing at high speed increases the chance that the traffic will be perceived as abusive. So to mitigate this, YARP uses TCP ACK probes. This is important because probing using SYN packets would cause receiving servers to half open a socket and maintain some state. So we don't want to have this impact on them. Whereas TCP ACK probes, if they don't match an open socket, are just going to be discarded. The random probing order avoids overloading individual paths. And when we run this, we coordinate with the local network admins and also have an opt-out mechanism 
so that we can avoid probing networks that don't want to be measured in this way. In general, when using TCP ACK probes, we have not received any opt-out requests. So for comparison, because ARC is the standard in this space and has been operating for decades, we'll look at how long it takes to complete a cycle or snapshot of the internet topology. So in this particular example, 37 monitors were used to send 11 million trace routes, and it took 31 hours. So a little over one day to complete this snapshot. The discovered topology included a million router interfaces and about 2 million links. YARP, using approximately the same destination set for comparison, being run for 100 seconds at 100,000 packets per second, sent 10 million probes and found about 180,000 unique router interfaces. In another instance, it found over 400,000 interfaces in less than 30 minutes. Since the time this talk was given, we have been running YARP at much larger scale to do complete internet snapshots and have also run it from multiple vantage points simultaneously. So here's a comparison of the discovery rate, which is of course the thing that needs to be accelerated if we want to complete snapshots more quickly. Here we're seeing a plot over about 1500 seconds, during which time YARP is able to collect over 400,000 router interfaces and comparing that with the rate at which the ARC platform collects data, noting that ARC intentionally runs slowly because they're using sequential traceroute and don't want to trigger ICMP rate limiting or get complaints from network operators. One measure of network impact is the number of ICMP error messages received that are not TTL expired messages, so some other type of error. And the common ones are TCP resets and port unreachable, network unreachable, etc. So the majority of these received are the TCP reset packets, which probably indicate that some probes are reaching a host, and the vast majority of these come from different hosts, meaning no one host is being affected too significantly by these TCP ACK probes. So one of the major applications of this is being able to do rapid snapshots, so seeing how the internet changes over relatively short periods of time. And from these YARP snapshots, we see that 9% of the paths change over these relatively short periods of time. So if we're getting a snapshot that takes a long time to compile, these changes will be blended into it in some way. That means our snapshot is not really accurate at the end. So by performing the snapshots much more quickly, we avoid that problem and also gain the ability to detect these changes over time. In order to see if these changes are real, one source of confirmation we can find is BGP routing tables. And in fact, the BGP churn confirmed the changes in the data plane observed by YARP. So in conclusion, YARP becomes especially interesting when we look at IPv6. The IPv6 address space is so much larger than IPv4 that there is much more probing to do, and being able to do this orders of magnitude faster than the existing techniques is particularly valuable when it comes to IPv6. We note that YARP is able to use UDP and ICMP probing in addition to TCP probing. It has methods to encode all the same information into those protocols as it does with TCP. And in practice and production systems, we typically use ICMP probing as opposed to the other two, but all of them can be valuable. And in some cases, one protocol is able to reveal parts of the network that another protocol is not. You could find more information at cman.org or by searching for YARP on GitHub. Thanks, that's all for now. We'll see you on the next one. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.